to stay. Hello and welcome back to Beyond Boards, a podcast dedicated to the actions and interests of skaters beyond skateboarding. After talking with Sarah Merle a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to chat with another talented skateboarder and artist from Sweden. And at this point, I guess I'm slowly and surely becoming a Swedish skateboarding podcast, which is absolutely fine by me. Tom Botwit grew up in Malmö, where he started skating. After studying art in Stockholm and Berlin, he came back to Malmö and started a little clothing and board brand with some of his friends by the name of Poetic Collective. The brand has grown quite a bit since then, and despite his busy schedule managing it as well as the band's Scandinavian team, Tom has kept killing it on a skateboard with the creativity and positivity that define him. So here's my conversation with Tom Botwith, I hope you'll enjoy it. Thanks again. Yeah, I'm really stoked. Yeah, me too. I took the time. I was in. Um, I was traveling uh, to Berlin last week because we have like uh, the logistics for what it goes out from there. So in the fo- in the plane and everything, I listened through some of your recent episodes too to to <laughs> yeah. get the full load on. Cool. So uh, with Jeremy and stuff, it was really cool to to listen to that too. Well, th- I actually had, uh, I chatted with Sarah last week. Uh, yeah, she Mel. told me. I actually met her on the uh, on Saturday. And yeah, she told me. Oh, cool. Me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm super stoked. Yeah, I, I, uh, we'll, we'll talk about Malmö later. But, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm always amazed by how positive and, and cool you all are for all these, all the Malmö people <laughs> I've talked to. It's, it, there seems to be kind of a, a vibe or just a... A lifestyle i don't know i don't know what it is exactly but i'm curious yeah it's uh it's it's really inspiring like there's so much cool skating and creativity and cool brands and initiatives coming out of malmo it's uh it's pretty sick yeah yeah it's uh it's a it's a pretty small community like on the saturday and now it's the 20 year anniversary of the local skate park uh, skate shop street lab And uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, just like in an event like that, you can kind of gather everyone and it's like all these different generations, like, uh, and uh, everyone knows each other and there's yeah. been like a lot of initiatives coming and there's also a lot of room in Malmö in that way that, I mean, I'm sitting here in our office now that's like pretty centrally located in Malmö, which is like insane to think about that we live like in a city and it's possible for us to have like a, an office central. Um, yeah. And just like, since the prices in Malmö are like a bit lower and all, Um, there's like room to like grow your own creative projects and stuff. And uh, I think that helps a lot too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I usually start these interviews by the guest uh, kind of introducing himself or herself. So if mm. you want to just tell me a little bit about yourself, especially like growing up when you first started skating and how, how yeah, how pretty much your journey with skateboarding started. Yeah, um, I started skating when I was maybe... Yeah, 11, I think. Just saw some people uh, at my school skating. But I had also always had a board. I think my my dad always tells me that I got like my first board when I was like two and a half. But I was kind of always around, but I didn't skate like properly until I was like 11. Okay. And then I started skating. We were living in the countryside then about an hour outside of Mama. Mm-hmm. And uh started skating a lot just at home, like in front of our house and stuff. And uh kind of like did that more and more and got super into it. And also straight away into it attracted me skateboarding in the way that it's something that you can like immense yourself in the culture and like read and look at videos and all and do it physically, which like was very good for me because I'm a very active person. But at the same time, I need like some kind of intellectual stimulants too. Sure. And then I was skating a lot there. And then when I was 16, we moved into Lund, which is right outside of Malmö. And I started going a lot, a lot to Brigeriet and yep. get to know all those people, go to Street Lab, where at that time Yuga was working and he was like the idol that you looked up to. And it's like, wow, like he's sponsored. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, like the uh, king. Yeah. <laughs> he was, the, he was definitely the king. He was like the up and coming king there. And, uh, Yeah, and skated a lot in Malmö during uh, my high school years then, and then uh, moved uh, straight after school to to Malaga and Barcelona, kind of going back and forth and skating and 
doing that lifestyle for a bit, skating Makba and like the classic plazas in Malaga. There was so much Swedish people down there. And then like the whole, at that time, like sweet skateboards had like this team, which yeah, is basically which, sour which became now, sour, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it became sour. So like Daniel Spang is Kofa Halgen and they were all living in Malaga and they were a bit older than me. And like, I came down there and I was like super stoked to see them skating and skate with them, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so that was super cool. Then after a while, I was living a bit in Stockholm after that. And then um, started becoming interested in art too. That's when you went to Berlin, I think, right? You studied yeah, art in Berlin? Yeah, I did like, I did a preparatory art school after, after Malaga. I did a preparatory art school in uh, Stockholm and then was accepted into the art academy in Berlin. Okay, And cool. I moved there and uh, I did my bachelor there in Berlin for three years. And, yeah. and during that, that time, been fun. I was... Yeah, that was fun. Berlin is uh, studying art in Berlin is intense, but it was uh, it was really fun, super fun. Like own studio space and also the whole skate scene there, and uh, learning German and getting kind of immense in. Oh yeah, in I didn't even think about that. But, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't speak. I had at that time a German girlfriend, so I spoke like a little bit of German, but not that much. And then I kind of had to learn it throughout the first year uh, to like be able to continue in the school. Uh, it worked out and uh, yeah. did that. How was the skating in Berlin at that time compared to uh, to Sweden or to Malmö? Like the skate scene, was it uh, welcoming or was it kind of difficult to was, make connections? No, or? I think it was really welcoming. Like in the way I just, at that point, like the one spot I knew in Berlin when I moved there was like the benches, you know, the Wasserhochstrasse benches. So I just yeah. went there a lot in the beginning and uh, got to know a bunch of people there. And uh, then start going with them to uh, to different spots in the city, and yeah, we filmed as part of like a crew that filmed some independent videos there in Berlin. Okay. So uh, it was really nice. Uh, met I mean all those the Germans are Jan Kleva and those guys that oh, yeah, were skating yeah. a lot there, and he was working at Kingpin at that time. And that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they published those those indie videos too. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a super fun time. So you, after that, you went back to, did you go back to Malmö or where did you go after Berlin? I kind of actually never lived in, I always, when I, when I was younger, then we lived outside of Malmö and I was going to Malmö a lot, but it wasn't until after Berlin that I moved to Malmö. Like and actually since, inside yeah, the city. To, yeah, exactly. Okay. So I always had like a lot of connections to Malmö, but wasn't living here. And then uh, I moved here, like now it's a couple of years ago. You mentioned Briguri, it's uh, the skate park in the high school. Was it around when you uh, were uh, like at that age or? Yeah, I just started at that age. Did you try to get in or? No, I was just uh, in the time when I had all, I had just started like uh, gymnasium and when that started and I was like, I wanted to go in, but then I was also already in this other school outside of Malmö. So I just decided to continue that and okay. I was going to Brigitte every day at that point anyway. So you were, and, yeah, you were still living it so, sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just I just going go on the to bus. the classes. But, uh, yeah. No, exactly. I was going to on the getting on the bus like every day after school and uh, going to Brigitte and skating with all the people there. Uh huh. So what about art? So did art uh, your interest for art? Did that begin as a teenager when you started skating, or did that come a bit later, maybe? Or I think I always like uh, drew and, and painted and was like a creative person, but like a more like say like more uh, serious uh, interest in art came when i was like just over 20 i think around that time you know okay but i mean it's also hard i think to differentiate like i through skateboarding you de develop like creative interests and interest in like maybe photography and painting and stuff that you don't think about that because you're just like, consuming a lot of like visual input through magazines and stuff and then that mm -hmm. later like maybe spills over into an interest like taking that deeper and getting interested in art mm -hmm. but i think through the preparatory art school and everything i got like more into like really like going to galleries and museum and art history and everything yeah 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 and uh, at that point were, were you sponsored already were you was your career as a pro skater kind of uh taking off or, or did that come a bit later as well or 
I always feel it's it's like weird to talk about my career as a pro skater because I feel like I well I mean uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is a career but, yeah I guess I mean I've, uh, I never earned a living from uh, from pro skating oh, but, uh, yeah but I think that's uh, that's but, uh, for I think many that's people maybe like yeah. for many people but uh, yeah I was sponsored uh, so getting some boards and some different stuff. I also okay. used to get, I thought it was funny when I was listening to Yuga's episode because like yep. he talks about these Hawaii dunks that he got and I was uh, like yeah, on yeah. his second second hand like shoe flow so I remember <laughs> okay. getting those Hawaii dunks that he had gotten because uh, I always okay, got these okay. bags of like Nikes because we had the same size like I was like the young kid with like the really big feet that got his old shoes. That's cool. No, but I was sponsored at that point and uh, filming and doing stuff and then kind of when I started studying art I kind of uh, left like some of those things behind I just focused more on art but also at the same time I was skating a lot just not as much as I was in like Malaga and Barcelona but then in Berlin I think I got like more into like filming and just being with this like little cruise and filming videos and it wasn't like focused on towards the company at that point. Mm -hmm. So when you went into art school, did you have like a plan in mind as to what you wanted to do after the school? Did you want to become an artist? Did you want, did you already have kind of the idea of having your own board brand? What was the plan basically? I think I wanted to be an artist, like just a painter, you know, uh, I didn't have the, the ambition then to start a brand. I feel like I was kind of skating and I didn't get to the level where I was making a living from it. So I thought I wanted to live like a free, a very free lifestyle where I could be my own boss. And I thought like, I'm interested in art, like painting, like this is, this is like the path that I'm going to take, you know, and mm -hmm. um, started doing that and having some exhibitions. And uh, that kind of was going in, in a good direction. But I also think that in the midst of all that, I was producing a lot of visual material and also looking at so much art history and everything. And uh, I just started the first thing with, I started making some stickers with Poetic and I was like, just we were doing, I had like a screen printing workshop at the Art Academy. Then, so I was just printing some t-shirts okay. and giving to some friends. But it wasn't uh, with the intention to start a serious uh, Building a brand. brand. Yeah, it, it started more as to a... Do something. Yeah, like a fun project with your yeah, friends. Yeah, like a fun project, doing some stuff like that. And uh... Okay. And what about the name Poetic Collective? I, w I couldn't find uh, what's... What, how did you come up? Did you come up with the name or was it... Uh... Yeah, 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 okay. I, I did. It's... Uh... I think I had printed some t-shirts and um, my friend uh, that's also still skating for the brand, Simon Schellqvist, yep. he had just finished school and he was down in Berlin living with me and uh, we were doing some of the screen printing together and then I think like it was, it, it was this loose, like more of a crew thing, like, oh yeah, let's call it this, like I just suggested it, like, oh yeah, okay. quite a collective, it's going to be nice, you know. We did some stickers and it was like, yeah, we had done some like mixtape edits. That was also still not a brand at all. It was just some some like random like we're filming with like a camera that we had and it was like a crew. So it's like a collective. And then we were putting I was really into like um, beat poets at that time. It was like putting like spoken word things from like Allen Ginsberg over. Right. right, uh, right yeah. Using like Howl. And I think that inspired me a lot to take that name. Yeah, that reminds me, uh, I saw yesterday uh, uh, a little bit of uh, a video that she made a few years ago. I don't remember the name of the video, but there were some voiceovers from, um, what's his name? It's a French artist, a super well-known uh, French Mar Marcel Duchamp. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I was like, oh, that's that reminded me a bit of um, Pontus's video, The Strongest of the Strange, with, uh, yeah. like, there's a, I think in Scott Bourne's part, there's a, a reading from uh, Bukowski. Bukowski, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that kind of made me th think about that a bit. So, so yeah, yeah so sure. you were heavily influenced by art and your video projects with the uh, yeah. poetic. Yeah. You still are, obviously. Yeah, it's, but, yeah. it's, it still is. It was like an organic process that kind of happened when I was in school that then, all right, we didn't, I didn't have a board sponsor at that time. And uh, we just decided to print some boards with like mm -hmm. an abstract print on more to just have and skate. And still there wasn't like the plan of, of starting a brand. If I think back 
on it. I think it's like a nice starting point and like a good way that it worked out that uh, like the, my reason for doing it and building it up was always, it was very organic and just passion driven and yeah. never being like, all right, we're going to be like one of like the top European skate brands and let's do it. But yeah, it was more like some friends who did some boards and it happened organically. And then it wasn't until like quite a while later where I was like, all right, I'm going to try to like focus more on this and make it something. Okay. Before we talk more about Poetica, I, I'd be interested in just asking you about uh, just the way you skate, basically, because you have a very unique uh, style of skating. When I see a clip of you, like I recognize you straight away. Like there's, there, I don't think there's anybody that skates sort of like you, you know. But yeah, I was just curious to know uh, how you developed that style, or or more like that trick selection. Maybe uh, is that something that did, did you always kind of skate like that, even when you were like a a teenager, or did that kind of develop through time? And did you go through different phases, maybe in your in the way you skate? And um, yeah, I'm just curious to know how you uh, decided to do, especially like all these tricks that I see. You You do like the nose tap nose grinds the like uh i don't even know what to call them like the kind of wally wally grinds uh yeah all those things that are super flowy and and uh and look super cool and uh yeah i'm just curious to know how you even thought about doing those tricks yeah first of all uh thank you i really appreciate that uh yeah absolutely and uh i definitely didn't always skate the way i do today it's been a process i think because when i was younger i was first i was super into like pj lad that was like my earliest like oh, really, really okay. heavy influence whereas i skated a lot of flat ground and wanted to do like these revert tricks I think I was always attracted to skateboarding that stood out in some way to me. Like he did like a few tricks that I hadn't seen anyone else do. So I was like, oh, I was mm -hmm. super, super into that. That I was like, oh, wow, that's something else. You know, I've never seen that. Like that's maybe try to do something like that. And then like start doing other tricks and reverting them. But yeah, a lot of flat ground. And, and then just generally like tech skating at that time. Mm -hmm. and then I think with the... Uh, I'm going to definitely credit these two guys for, for the nose tap. There's two Swedish skaters that never get like the hype that they deserve, which mm -hmm. is like Ed Eric Pedersen. He skate, still skates for Sour. Right. He had like some kind of like in like a list when this company was around, like a little extra part, but he did like one of these like nose tap things into manual. And okay. that was also like one of those moments when I was a kid, I was like, I saw that and I was like, oh, that's something I've never seen before. And another guy called Malcolm Telgord that, that lived in Barcelona is also from Stockholm. They also did like a lot of like these nose tap tricks. Okay. And they also had like, did a few tricks that, that people just didn't do. So every time you saw him, you were like, oh, you react, you know, it provokes a reaction. Yeah, exactly. And that always attracted me. And I think uh, I started kind of like dabbling a little bit in those tricks. And then I think I managed to do some of them. All the Wally stuff and all, I always thought it looked really nice. And, you know, it's kind of when you start, where, you start at one point, I think about skateboarding, it's like super pretentious to say that really, but it's like, I think about skateboarding these days kind of like the same way as doing art that you kind of like, one teacher said to me once that normally you do like, you do a little bit of one thing, a little bit of another thing, a little bit of third thing. Nothing gets like really interesting because you don't spend enough time on it. You never like develop it far enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And with art, I was like, you, you stay on one thing and you kind of dig deeper in the subject and you reach something that's like unique to you. Mm-hmm and has like a lot of identity and i think that's kind of the way that i at some point during my art studies i think i started approaching intentionally or unintentionally starts approaching skateboarding with the similar mindset you know that i'm gonna like oh i'm gonna do these things that i do and kind of three see how i can develop them and that's kind of what inspired me to develop things that i hadn't seen before or didn't see much of this yeah definitely i'm not the only one doing these tricks there's other people too but but kind of go deeper into it you know Mm -hmm. and i think that's kind of the path that i've been on with the skating for for a while you know and then you go into the rabbit hole you know it's like <laughs> exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you're yeah, like oh you learn one thing and you're like oh yeah i could do this out or this in or like kind of move into it that way but i think the approach to be more intentional in, about like trick selection and stuff there it definitely had, takes inspiration from like uh from making art yeah 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 So, I mean, as you were saying, so what attracted you at first, like with PJ Ladd, for example, was uh, that he stood out, like the way he skated yeah. was different. And uh, so, so that's someone else. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought about it a while ago that it's always been like something that I've been attracted to, that originality. Uh, and it felt like oh, authenticity too, like it's unique to that person. And there's like an identity in the skateboarding. It's not only performance based, you know, yeah. it's not only good, but it's also like it says something about the person and they kind of thought about it and developed like a, a thought process around it. And I mean, that's not can be the tricks or the spots or, or anything, but it's like unique to that person. Mm -hmm. and that always attracts me a lot in skateboarding yeah i feel like that's what attracts you to um like some of the writers of Podic collective they definitely all have a very unique style and way of skating yeah and uh, i'm sure you carefully like select them so to speak because uh, just they have a very singular yeah just identity and way of skating Yeah, they do. And I always, I always try to encourage that too, you know, in people, even like with some of the younger artists that we have to also encourage them to kind of take their own route, you know, and yeah, develop yeah. themselves and not try to look at like, oh, this person's doing that or like, because I'm always, like I said a lot to like, to Samuel, for example, case, there's like other people doing that, like that are doing it better than you're ever going to do, you know, and there's def there's people doing tricks that I'm never going to do, you know, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. I also don't have to do them, you know, they're better at that, let them do it, like I'm going to do like what I can do and what I enjoy and develop that. Yeah. What about like growing up? Did you ever uh, like fr from sponsors or other skaters? Did it, did you ever get shit, so to speak, from people telling you, oh, like, uh, why aren't you doing uh, like tray flips or crooks, snotty heels? I, well, I don't know, you know, just a more standardized kind of skating. Did you ever get that kind of feedback from people telling you, oh, why are you skating like this? Like, uh, why aren't you, aren't you skating like the norm, basically? Yeah, I think I definitely still still get that, and uh, there's always there's. But I think there's also I always try to think that if something's gonna stand out in any way, and someone's really gonna like it, they're also gonna be like a lot of people that don't like it. And, right, right, uh, and that's fine. That's fine. If you if you do something that everyone likes, then you're also not provoking any kind of reaction. Like it's not gonna be like that. No one's gonna really like it if they can also really dislike it. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And it's fine. I don't want everyone to. Yeah. If something you like is very, approval. it's very neat. It's like a niche thing, you know. Like it's not gonna be liked by everyone, and it's completely fine. Sure. But yeah, definitely. I mean, there's it's always like the he cannot ollie comment. Like this guy can ollie, <laughs> don't not, not even ollie. Uh, I've seen you do ollies for sure, but uh, yeah, not not very often. But yeah, <laughs> I, I skate I skate like a lot of flat ground actually. But it's uh, it's the same there. Like I enjoy skating flat ground, but at the same time, like when you're like filming and doing stuff like specific, like want to do these tricks that are like kind of stand out in some way, you know. And then that's kind of what what gets caught on video, and that becomes like the image that's portrayed. Then. Yeah, but I I can ollie. <laughs> no, I'm sure. No, I've seen it. I've seen it. <laughs> There's proof. There's proof. No, it's it's. I, I really enjoy uh, your skating because it's just um, like it makes me think. Like, what did he just do? <laughs> like uh, sometimes it's like nose tap to nose grind to board slide to front shove out or to, uh, it's like it, it takes a second to process it. You know, yeah. Uh, rather than seeing a, a more standardized skate video where you're like, okay, like. Yeah, I don't know. It just really stands out. That's what I really like about your skating and, and Poetic Collective as a brand in general is that it's it's very unique. Like there's no other company like that. So that's really cool. No, I appreciate that. And then, I mean, at the same time, I always think that I don't want, like I choose to skate one way, but I don't want it to be the rep represent the whole brand either. Like I like yeah. that also that we have like Simon, for example, is like an old friend of mine, but we, he skates like, he skates super tech, like switch back tail flip out. Uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah, a, yeah. Lot, a lot of the times, like, of course people see the brand and they think about like how I skate, but it's also every one yeah. of the brand skates like different, but they all have like their own approaches. Uh, but I've yeah. definitely gone into that thing where I want like each trick to to be like surprising somehow you know yeah carefully curated sort of and yeah. yeah yeah i see and so at what point did uh, would you say that poetic collective transition from a fun project to a legit brand There's like a few different like uh, points to that. I think there's like at one point where I decided, I would say like four or five years ago, that I was going to focus more on it, that I was going to like try try to make it into a real brand, you know? Yeah. But at that point, there's still no no like economy into it. I'm still working at that point full time with, uh, I was working at a museum curating exhibitions. Yeah, I heard that uh, yeah, in, in an interview yeah. somewhere. Yeah. And I was working at Brigadier at skate coaching too. Oh, okay. So I had both two jobs and also uh, kind of building the brand at the yeah. same point. 
But then about a year, two years ago, I would say, I decided to uh, kind of, that's when I was able to take like a leap and kind of do it also as a job, you know. Okay. Work fully on that and not have a, yeah. a side job. Yeah. Exactly. I still work for Vans too. Uh, I manage uh, manage the team for Scandinavia, but that's oh, like cool. a small a small part time job, and like a big big part of my time goes uh, into what I collected these days. Okay. So now now it's work, but it hasn't been work uh, until quite recently, actually. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And did, did COVID? Uh, I mean, it's a stupid question. Of course, COVID affected your business, but uh, but how how deeply did it affect your business? Basically, did, was it very difficult for these last two years for you? I think. COVID, it's, it's been like a crazy ride because at first a hit and we got like a lot of canceled pre-orders and stuff. And I thought it was going to have a big effect. Yeah. And then like straight after what happened is a lot of US brands couldn't deliver boards to Europe. Right, and we right. had an insane, there was an insane, every skate shop will tell you this and brand too, like there was an insane demand for skateboards. And if you could deliver, you could sell it, you know. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, the brand grew a lot during that time, you know, even though we had uh, a lot of uh, delivery problems and stuff like that we still like managed to deliver not always on time but still okay and that, that helped us grow a lot and i think it's not until quite recently the effects of covid now it's like there's a lot of skate shops are overstocked because they placed very large orders so there's not like a demand for hardware shipping prices all over the world has gone up insanely after covid and we oh, also okay. have like price of cotton price of organic cotton going up so much so like the price increase in the last year or even last six months has been insane so now we're definitely feeling the effects of covid i think more than when it was like in full effect okay Interesting. there's always like a few few steps to it you know like first it hits and then you think you're gonna have this direct effect but it takes a while for prices to increase because like shipping costs go up and then kind of now it's hitting me and i think also at some point of course it's going to land in skate shops you know that probably like price of goods are gonna i think we're already seeing it with a lot of other yeah, things yeah. that we buy food and stuff the prices have gone up and mm -hmm. that's definitely gonna happen to to skateboards and apparel too Yeah, for so sure. now I think now we're like struggling to see where, all right, like what is like, how can we keep like a price that's okay while still producing things that we need to produce? Yeah. And I guess the war in Ukraine is, is not gonna. No, uh, it's help, also uh, that, that comes down on well. top of that with uh, the whole that crisis and how that affects like the world economy. Yeah. So strange times. Yeah, strange times and definitely like uh, the last two years have been uh, mad in the way that you never, it's very hard to plan because prices and everything changes like from day to day and uh, makes makes it very difficult to have a like a long term plan and like sure. keep delivery dates. And be, oh, we're going doing spring on this date and selling here and delivering there and then somewhere here. And then you're like, oh, no, we had like a two month delay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's crazy, I'm sure. And so how do you um, manage um, Poetic Collective? So you're the founder and the, the boss, basically. But I, I'm sure you must uh, have other people involved in other things. Like, because uh, I, I can't imagine that you're doing absolutely everything from like uh, skating, doing graphics, ordering all the goods, uh, shipping them, um, dealing with uh, like sales and doing the videos and, and editing them. And uh, so basically, how do you manage? Because it must be a lot of work to, to do uh, even a small skateboard brand. It must be so much work. Well, yeah, it's uh, definitely a lot of work. And I've definitely for a, a long time did basically all of those things that you can't set up myself and also worked other jobs at the same time. I think from the outside, sometimes like running a skateboard company looks like, oh, you print some boards and then you sell yeah, them. And then easy. <laughs> that's easy, you know, and then you're like, oh, yeah, there's like a lot of other stuff too. But sure. I mean, now I do a large part of the graphics. I would mm -hmm. say like maybe 95% of the graphics and uh I also film and, and shoot photos and stuff. But we have now I'm working with, I worked for a long time with my brother also that helped with the design. Uh, Paul, right? Yeah, Paul. And uh, he's an uh, incredibly talented uh, graphic designer and also like UX designer and builds like order systems that we use and everything. And uh, he's also helped edit a lot of the early videos and also yeah. the latest one. He also like put the final touches and did a lot of the music for it together with his friend. Joe That's R. right. Yeah, I saw that he made some of the music. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So he's multi-talented and definitely helped shape the brand into what it is now. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, also my friend Marcus works with me and he's been filming for the brand for a long time and uh, okay. is now also involved uh, in the design process and works with me here at the office. So I think Paul is doing a bit less, Marcus is doing a bit more. So we're basically two people here uh, doing all everything that you see from the brand. So that's a large part of the work. And then there's like a setup of distributions uh, throughout mm -hmm. the world of Sally, you know, but we prepare all the material and I do a lot of the sales myself for large parts of Europe too, still myself. And uh, then logistics is now shipped and handled uh, in Berlin through something called quarter distribution, which is run by an old friend of mine, Max too. Okay. So there's, and that's quite, quite recent too, like up to, until a year and a half ago, I was also packing boxes here in Malmö. I had like another more industrial kind of office where we had like pallets coming in and repacking and packing. But oh, yeah. at some point it's like, you can't do it all. If you want to grow, you're holding yourself back a little bit. And also you have to recognize what you're good at and what you're not good at. And uh, I think uh, when you're doing everything yourself, you're reaching like a certain level on everything, but you're reaching like maybe like 60, 70, you're like doing it, but not like perfecting it. And I yeah. think... And someone you're getting burned out a bit, I guess. Yeah, you're getting yeah. burned out. And if you have someone specialized in logistics, they will do that. Someone's it's like a filmer who will film instead and like helping with that. And that all, that kind of helps you race into becoming better at everything. And that's kind of like the path we've been on like in the last year and a half to kind of like really like fine tune all those things to, to make the brand better. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. in every in every way you know but i still do and oversee i oversee and do all orders and handle all the production stuff and also uh, i definitely handle all of that and it's still the brand is a hundred percent like owned and run by me you know there's yeah. no outside investors or anything so it's uh it's very much like a core a core skateboard company you know yeah so I'm I'm happy about that. That's also something that I'm like proud of, you know, like to manage to build it up. I remember like when we were doing the first boards, it was like me saving from studying, saving up like a thousand euro to be able to order some boards, you know, and then to, to build it from there yeah. and uh, be able to, to do it like independently. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, what about like the, the team? Like, do you, um, how do you uh, work with your team? Do you kind of stay in touch with them regularly to make sure they produce content? Do you ask them to do clips for Instagram? Do you ask them, you know, to film for videos or projects like, a, or do you kind of just let them do their thing and you trust them and whatever happens, happens sort of like what's, what's your way of handling uh, your team basically? Yeah, I mean, I, I manage the team myself and uh, I definitely stay in contact with everyone regularly and try to like see where they are at and also plan projects for us, you know, book trips and bring everyone. And I think the team has very much of like a, a family feeling and it's very yeah. important to me. I mean, I started that way and I wanted to like always like introduce like one or two new people at a time. So you kind of get into the vibe that we have on trips and uh, and develop that, you know. Mm -hmm. so we keep keep the same feeling that it's not just like a loose group like thrown together once a year in a van exactly yeah but there's like us that you support each other and that you that you click as people too you know and because mm -hmm. uh, i think that's kind of what makes makes it too you know that it's not like a big company with like a huge team that where the people never met each other and you just throw them in a video but just yeah the people actually know each other and uh, and like each other and hopefully that shines through uh, in the videos too you know yeah 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 but I, yeah, no, I, we plan projects like the video now and we go on trips and film for that. And I uh, kind of make that plan together with uh, with Marcus, the films a lot. And then uh, then I also, of course, ask them for, for content, you know, for Instagram and stuff. But a yeah. lot of times, a lot of times they kind of do that themselves. I mean, everyone, they know what they should should be doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, no, but it's, uh, I love them all, you know, and uh, the brand would not be where it's at, you know, without the people that helped build that. You know, and uh, yeah, especially someone like Simon, who was like a kid when like we started, and he believed it, and he's kind of developed with this like powerhouse skateboarder who's uh, super sick. He's you know? impressive, like, yeah. yeah, 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 and like very, and or Samuel also that gone, and like he's become like a part of the identity of the brand and building that, you know, and uh, yeah. I like also uh, from the last video. I, I didn't know her, uh, Elena Long. Yeah. Yeah, Helena's amazing. Hel Helena, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's uh, she's super sick. Yeah, 
Yeah, she's from London and uh, she's amazing. She's also like the best person. She was here just like uh, a, f- a few weeks ago for filming for the Solan collab we just did. And every, oh, yeah, every time that, we meet, yeah. it's uh, so nice. She's such a positive force to have on trips, you know, she's amazing. Yeah, I love seeing her clips. Like she's great energy and great uh, yeah, creative so skating. Yeah, such good energy and so good, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah this, the team is sick. Yeah, congrats on that last video. Uh, which it came out like a month ago, right? It's very yeah, recently. Yeah, like a month ago. Oh, yeah, a month ago on Thrasher there. Really enjoyed it. Yeah. Did you have premieres for it? Did you go to Berlin to do a premiere, maybe or? No, in Berlin, it wasn't really possible due to COVID, but we did uh, in Paris. Uh, I was in Paris oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, then we did a big Malmö premiere. Okay. We brought everyone here and then there's like a lot of shop premieres throughout Europe. kind of offered like some of our like more like long term, like really good accounts that we work with and shops to, to do premieres. And they hosted that from like Bordeaux to Antwerp to all over the place, you know, and uh, yeah. it's always like super. I want to like support the skate shops that uh, they can do some stuff to activate their community and it's like brings awareness to the brand and uh, so I think there's a good amount of premieres throughout Europe especially and even like yeah, some in the US too and in Asia so that was really really cool yeah yesterday I was checking out your website and uh, I saw that you had a lot of shops in France uh, I was surprised yeah. uh, but I mean you have uh, uh, Santiago uh, who's a French skater yeah. on the team but yeah no I was, I was just surprised how, how how many there were in France is France like a big big market for you guys or yeah I think it's uh, we also like um, Xavier who does like Street Life Agency which is our French uh, distribution has done a great job you know so we have like 20 shops I think really good shops a lot of them like Nospo and then the stuff yep. guys in Paris to Bordeaux, Sirop, and yeah, a lot of really, really cool shops uh, that have supported us for a long time. Mm-hmm. Cool. So uh, just to finish with um, the team and, and Poetic Collective, uh, I liked also that in the video there were a lot of uh, female and male skaters skating together. And I think you said in an interview that um, that's something you're very attached to, uh, as to um, have a whole team together rather than have like a girl section or, or like a girl team, you know, kind of how it, it's been done in the past or even in recent times to a certain degree. Yeah, even in recent times, I think it's still somewhat of the norm of how it's presented in a lot of skate videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I talked with Sarah about uh, Gizmo, the latest uh, Nike video. Yeah. And Van- Vance did a video, like a female skater video recently yeah. too. I don't remember the name, but... Uh... But yeah, no, so so I was stoked to see that I don't think I've seen many skate videos that had as many girl skaters and they're not just in a little section, like a friend section, so to speak, but they're actually like uh, they have full parts and they're skating yeah. with, with all the crew and everything. So yeah, is that something you've really tried to emphasize or? Yeah, that's definitely something that's uh, really important to me. I mean, I want to say also that I think it's super sick with like the all-female uh, skate videos too. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's super, super sick to see that. But for me, kind of like the next level to that is always to kind of have a mixed genders, you know, where it doesn't really matter, where you focus more on the crew. And like if I see someone, I think they have like a sick style and all, and then it doesn't matter to me if they're male or female or sure. how they identify, but they're a, a sick person and a cool skater and they should be in the video yeah yeah and to kind of push that and also to become it's also about identity that i I think it's important to to increase the representation and if we can lead in that sense to be like to create that was like one of the goals with Klaus. we created a skate video that was almost at like a 50 percent 50 50 percent ratio male Mm -hmm. and female skaters you know and uh that's something you never see which is to me insane i mean there's so many sick female skaters out there that deserve like so much more attention than they get and Mm -hmm. uh if we can be a place that puts like them in the limelight i think that's something that i'm super hyped on you know and uh yeah to just do that you know and uh yeah and i think it's also like good for the dynamics on tour for the dynamics in the video to like not be like just guys sitting like in an apartment or going on tour together but to have like uh just a mixed tour it just becomes it's a lot a lot better yeah 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 everybody wins yeah yeah 
All right, so so you skate for film trucks. Uh, we talked about yes. Jeremy at the beginning. Uh, I was just wondering how how did that connection happen? How, uh, because I think film trucks started in 2018 around there. Yeah. Uh, after Cliche was ended. So how did uh, how did you get on the team? And uh, I saw that you recently had a, a truck, a pro truck, also. So yeah, just uh, can you tell me a bit about how that happened? I think it was uh, me and, and Jeremy were DMing a bit back and forth and I think he liked what a poetic and I thought film trucks was cool and it's I thought it was very like brave and uh, sick that he did like a European truck company people yeah. are like really conservative when it comes to trucks you know but yeah. <laughs> to do like to go all out and do that I thought that was uh, really inspiring and uh, cool told him that and we were talking and uh We did like a Poetic collab truck too early on. Yep. And uh, he supported us and I supported him. And then uh, he sent me trucks. And then I got to know Leo Wals too. Yeah, you shared and, a part uh, with him uh, yeah, at some we, point. Yeah, yeah, we filmed like a film trucks part together. So that was like the first uh, project that I did for film trucks, you know. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, And with that, also my friend Marcus that works with me here filmed that part with me and Leo. And that was really cool too, to get that experience too. It's also nice sometimes to do something that's like outside of Poetic, you know, that like I, my skating is now like always like with my own brand, but I kind of recently also tried to focus it more like towards other things. Sure. Like yeah, film yeah. trucks to also have like, I want like the team to, to be the brand, not, not me. And uh, it was cool to like do something also only as a skater where you're not involved in the... Yeah, like the management and... The, yeah, yeah. yeah, and I mean, to me, it's super cool. Like I've always like uh, looked up to Jeremy a lot and like what he did with Cliché, uh, yeah. super inspiring and what he's doing with film trucks. And even like visiting him in Lyon is really cool. Like he has like his office, super central, go to HTV, skate there, do the slappies, you know, like he's a legend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, recently with the pro truck, that was a dream come true, you know, like uh, I was super stoked on that. That's uh, still a bit surreal to me Yeah, <laughs> uh, to look down and see your name there. But I tried to do my best, you know, to deserve it, film a part, uh, do some tricks and uh, yeah. Yeah, oh, I mean, you deserved it, man. Uh, no, no worries about that. I appreciate that. <laughs> You mentioned Leo Leo Vals, uh, yeah. He's uh, like uh, the part you shared with him was cool because uh, I think your your skatings are not similar, but uh, they, there's definitely some they kind of mirror themselves. I don't know. They they function well together, basically. Yeah, I guess. I mean, we skate like soup not at all as each other because like he does tricks that I never Power could do. Slides. I think I do, I do tricks that he doesn't do, but yeah. uh, I always I always looked up to Leo like from when I was young. You know, like when I started seeing his skating because it's also Going back to what I said with like that I liked like PJ Ladd and when you know, I was a kid as someone that really stands out, you know, and mm -hmm. creates like their own niche, like and people will think what they think about that. But if someone does like a power slide trick anywhere in the world now, like you're gonna have people be like, Oh, Leo Valls. And yeah, that's yeah, like yeah. he basically created like this own like thing genre. within skateboarding genre and uh built that and uh yeah. I think that is really impressive. So definitely a lot of respect for that. And uh it was really nice to visit him in Bordeaux and film with him and all these uh, everything that he's done there with the skate scene and all is uh, really cool yeah too. I think that Bordeaux has definitely drawn a lot of inspiration from what you guys have been doing in Malmö for like 20 years at this or even more like uh, Arnaud Dudieu I don't know if you know him he, he built yeah. uh, he started like this program kind of kind of like Big Rietz, but just uh, after high school and, yeah. uh, and Leo has been working with the city a lot to develop uh, skatable obstacles and, yeah. and like uh, places around the city so yeah I think uh, they definitely took a lot of inspiration from uh, what's been happening in Malmö yeah for sure One question that I try to end the interviews with is uh, what is the most valuable lesson that you feel you've learned from skateboarding? Whether it's from the, like actually skateboarding or, you know, something in the culture of skateboarding, what kind of sticks out to you? I mean, I think it's, uh, I think John touched upon this in his, uh, the interview you did with him too, but it's, uh, it definitely is true. And something that I brought with me from skateboarding into running the company and everything is that you try so many times, you know, and you just keep trying and you keep trying and keep trying. And somehow it's like really, really stupid, really, that sometimes you try <laughs> like a million times and you're like, oh, I'm probably going to make it on the next one. But you bring that with you, like you have that in skateboarding and then you bring that with 
you into other things and you keep trying whereas like a lot of people that maybe don't come from skateboard need to try something and i hear it a lot of times with like other friends they're like i tried it, it's not my thing or i'm not good at it you know yeah and i'm like wow if i had that approach you know like i'm trying something at terror right 10 times i'm like i'm not good at it it's not my thing you know i would not do like yeah you just, you just you know? give up and never do anything yeah it doesn't because you expect like more of an instant uh, gratification you exactly. know where skateboarding yeah. is like a lot about delayed gratification you know and um that's definitely something that skateboarding taught me to keep going and push that and then finally things work out and even when it, they work out then you're like oh i want to improve it i want to make it better it's also this constant strive for uh, to make it better to improve you know to move forward with the uh, progression you know in like every mm -hmm. aspect of life you know I mean, sometimes that can also be i wish i had i mean some people can skateboard and not have that too which i sometimes admire where you can maybe just go out and just enjoy for what it is more but i still have this thing where i'm like oh i want to like do this or like learn this or film that or get better at the that trick you know but that approach drives you forward all the time too so mm -hmm, i think it's mm -hmm. like that's something that you can learn from skateboarding even though sometimes i mean of course sometimes it's good to also just enjoy it for what it is and just uh, cruise you know yeah yeah of course but yeah most valuable lesson definitely that if you keep trying if you keep trying like things work out and then just that grit like you know? don't give up too easily yeah no don't give up too easily just keep going grit keep going and if you can like envision it and think about it and then you can make it into a reality too yeah, yeah, yeah. and so what's uh what's next basically for you uh, what what projects are you working on uh, as we're speaking uh you just released a video so i assume there won't probably won't be another full length uh, at least not right now uh maybe in a few months or years but probably some edits and some parts from uh, individual writers or something but uh yeah what, what do you have uh going on right now yeah there's uh there's a few things i mean there's our uh, next poetic drop uh, gonna go out the summer drop now in may then it's the fall drop that we designed and everything so we're always working on on you the next season you know and planning that and then trying to improve those things and um i have some projects with bands that we work on too like with the nordic team here that is gonna come out throughout the year too and all those people on the killed it too and uh then i think with poetic there's gonna be like we're gonna start working on a new promo now i think we have the first like little filming things next week here okay and malma and uh, i think every time when you finish a project it's also a good time to to reevaluate and kind of uh, see what you want to do for the next one yeah yeah so we're gonna have like there's gonna be some new introductions on the team side i think we're like uh there's gonna be some new arms coming in and also try to set like clear vision for the next project so it's also important i think for everyone to not like just start the same project again but to kind of switch it up switch yeah. the environments add some new people so you're not repeating yourself but instead try to see like all right this is what we did how can we improve like what's the next project and uh move move forward together you know yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's it i think for for the more recent things like uh, new poetic uh, video projects new drops new vans videos and then just always trying to improve everything you know it's a constant with like cotton sew apparel trying to new <laughs> work on new pieces new samples uh, doing all that so it's always it's, uh, it's like a never-ending uh, thing you always try to get better <laughs> you know and uh, and move move forward yeah You mentioned uh, a bit earlier a, a collab you just did with uh, was it so Soulland or something like that? Yeah, Soulland's a, a really really cool Danish uh, fashion label run by uh, Silas Adler and Jakob Kampalina. They did like three Nike shoes too. They did like Soulland Nike SP, mm -hmm. the Friday projects that Yuga did with them too, which is really cool. And uh, Silas skates too, and uh, the collab was very natural. But it was cool to do boards and apparel with them. They do super premium apparel too and uh did like a little video clip for that so that just came out like a week 10 days ago maybe so working on moving forward and then yeah trying to skate a lot too you know yeah the weather is getting warmer i guess in malmo as we speak or yeah it's getting warmer it's pretty sunny i'm going to try to skate this afternoon again and skating yesterday and uh see if we see if we manage a new video part this year oh <laughs> yeah see. i hope so yeah 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 Yeah, trying to, like, same there, trying to not repeat myself too much, but, like, uh, we'll try to come up with some new stuff. Sure, sure, sure. Awesome. All right, so let's finish with the friends' questions. 
So I have a question from, we mentioned her earlier, uh, Helena Long. She said, if you didn't do Poetic Collective, which board company would you want to write for? I guess running your own company is kind of like running your own vision and what you want your skating output to be. But if you didn't have the passion and drive for your own thing, who do you think does it well out there too? Thank you, Helena, for the question. I appreciate that. If I didn't run my own board company, what would I skate for? There's so many people that do a really great job, I think. You know, like, uh, I'm definitely, being from here, like, this whole first generation, as I think of it, of European skateboard brands with, like, or first is maybe cliche then, but, like, this new generation where it's, like, Polar, Magenta, Palace, I always think they were, like, the ones that inspired, like, the, the second uh, yeah. the second movement, you know? Like, I think they do all do a, a great job. And uh, now I also think... Think. there's like some other like that i think together with with poetic is maybe like next with like yard sale and rave and stuff and pop trading company that, oh yeah, yeah. you know like the next generation again of board brands mm -hmm. yeah i mean all those guys do uh, an amazing job you know like i would uh, i would be happy to to represent them all i was thinking about that yesterday when she sent me the question i was like oh uh, who uh, yeah. who would i see you skate for other than poetic collective and yeah. i was like oh magenta would uh magenta would feel like a good fit just because you're like good friends with leo and it's also a very creative yeah. company uh Hey, maybe maybe that's the thing. Maybe we should ask ask uh, Vivian and Leon on the <laughs> guest board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah let's let's make it happen. <laughs> Yeah, they do a great job. So that would, for example, be super, super sick, you know. But if someone has a vision like that, I would have, it's, it's really cool, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this one is from uh, Ben Koppel, like a uh, roller yeah. surfer on Instagram. Roller surfer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He asked an interesting question, actually. He said, which skater is your favorite painter? Because I was trying to think who's who's a famous skater and painter. And uh, I mean, obviously, Mark Gonzalez is uh, known... Mm. I heard also that Mark Johnson paints a lot, but I, I don't mm. think I've ever seen any of his paintings, actually. I haven't seen any of his painting. I'm trying to now think about people. It's, as I, Mark Gonzalez is obviously like someone that everyone knows, you know, who's like an artist and, uh, and a skateboarder. Mm -hmm. It's a hard one. But Difficult. Yeah, that probably takes a... You would need to think about it for a bit. Yeah. Soy, Soy Panda oh, yeah. is also really, I mean, he does all the magenta stuff and, uh, and is a really sick skater, you know, yeah, yeah. but I mean, the Gons is, uh, I have the book here that Julian talked about too, the, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. here in the office, the, definitely also someone who's like talking about identity and skateboarding, he's like curated and like made himself into this character that, that represents kind of creativity within skateboarding. So in that way, I think he's definitely like the one, yeah. Uh, You can't go wrong with uh, the Gons, yeah. <laughs> can't go wrong with the Gons, no. <laughs> exactly. All right, so the next questions are audio, so let's see. All right, let's do this one. Hey, Tom, what's up? So I have a question about the origin of your nose tap, nose grinds. Can you tell us uh, the origin of them? How did you decide to learn them? And a uh, bonus question, how do you know the inward out of them? Because for me, that's impossible. Right, take care. Do you recognize the voice? It must be difficult, but uh... no, it's difficult. It's French, I think. It's uh, Bastien Bastien Rogest. Ah, Bastien. Yeah, yeah. Of course, <laughs> Bastien's the the legend. Yeah, filmer who made a lot of projects with film trucks and. Yeah, and his own, like, these beer videos. Right. And also, like, low-key, like, people don't know that, but he's a super sick skater, too. I've seen some clips of him. He's really good, yeah. Really, that switch nose money, like, back 180 switch nose money, half cap flips and stuff. He's super yeah, sick. Yeah, he's really good, yeah. But, yeah, thank you, Bastian, for the for the question. I think the origin, like I said, was that, like, before, that first yeah. moment with, like, Eric Pedersen, you know, where he does, like, at Parallel in Barcelona, he does, like, nose tap and, like, it goes straight to Manny, you know. That's definitely it was the first inspiration. And then alongside him, this other Swedish skater, Malcolm Telgård. He did, like, one of the craziest things at Parallel ever. And, like, just a homie video, I think they posted it on free a while ago uh, regarding those nose taps where he does, like, front shove into to nose tap and then bounces to a manual which is insane he's such a six skater mm -hmm. that people don't really know of. yeah so that's like the origin i think i saw those tricks and like i really wanted to learn it just going into anything you know and then i mean learned it into crooks and then started doing it more and more and then there was like a long process of being able to like first do him maybe not grind that long but into like being to do them and like maintain speed i think is the hardest thing with that trick you know oh, yeah, uh, for sure. that takes time because you're like you lose a lot of speed when you hit it but you want to be like fast enough to maintain the speed yeah 
It must take forever to learn that trick. Like, a, yeah. Your feet have to be super light that you like go, go fast into it. Exactly. Um, yeah. Then, I mean, to nollie inward heel out, that's... <laughs> I thought for a long time because I was, I was doing the nose grinds a lot and like the crooks and I was like, oh, I want to do something out, like a flip trick out, you know, I was trying a lot of different things and I was doing, trying and then later doing like some not like regular nollie heel stuff, but it kind of more like folded out. It wasn't as nice. Now skating with um, a friend here that John mentioned too, that works at Brigadier, at Stefan Osterheim. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, he's incredible. Region skater. He's, he's incredible, yeah, you know. He's really talented. Yeah. And he knows like everything about tax skating and he's like, yeah, maybe you could like not inward he like go it goes like forward like you can because i can do him flat like quite well i was like oh and i was thinking about that trick and yeah it made sense it kind of worked you know made sense better you know but i definitely worked on that that one for like a while and also like learned it and kind of kept it like low key because i wanted it in this film trucks part to kind of like be to like end the it because yeah. uh, like there's like a bunch of those taps and i kind of end with the the banger one you know mm-hmm. so i was like trying to i was skating the the plus of what i always skate here swamping but trying to uh like do them when there's like not that much people or right? try it so i would like oh and then i filmed one i was like oh super mm-hmm. stoked that i uh, i got that but uh, yeah now now i have to try something new so <laughs> yeah like no <laughs> tray or nolly bastion told me that like a lot of times nolly tray so i've been trying that one so let's see if that happens i've seen you do a lot of nolly trays so i'm sure i'm sure you could do that yeah. for sure like if you spent a bit of time i think that one that one could work or like i was also trying to like nolly front side heel like do like an overturn back nose and nolly front side heel off or something like oh that. nolly front side heel okay yeah something like that could be or nolly backside heel i also i've been working yeah on the nolly back heel but yeah it's uh it's quite a you have to a lot of things has to like you have to get into it stand on the grind maintain speed over and then have like the focus at the end to flip so yeah it, mu- it must be a mind fuck to do these tricks like because there's so much to do right until the point where you arrive at doing the last the, like the nolly inward heel yeah. or whatever other tricks so it, like if you try it forever it must get so tiring uh yeah yeah, it does. I mean, I've I've done the no the tap into nose grind so much that that one kind of goes on on auto by yeah. itself. But then uh, it's definitely like a lot of like different uh, motions until you get to like the final final motion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, next question. Hello, Tom. I hope you're doing good. This is uh, Jeremy from uh, France uh, Film Trucks office in France. At first, um, thanks to bring something different and uh, fun in skateboarding. I really enjoy that. And uh, my question would be, um, do you think the weather brings uh, something special in skateboarding? Because uh, Sweden is not uh, the best weather, but some very good skateboarders come from uh, Sweden. So do you think the weather has something to play in this? Talk soon, man. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jeremy, for the question. And yeah, thanks to Jeremy for bringing so much to skateboarding, uh, so much positive force uh, in uh, European skateboarding come from him. Mm-hmm. And I appreciate the kind words from him. Yeah, with the weather in uh, skateboarding, I think in Sweden, you know, like there's a long tradition of indoor skate parks too. Right. And uh, an indoor skate park also becomes this place where there's, you're not like outside in like in the ice plaza in Barcelona. There's like where there's like a billion dice tra- distractions. Yeah, people you know? walking through. You're just through. like in this park. Yeah, walking through or like even like fun things happening. So you end up like doing something else or more like chilling with your friends. Right. Because the skate park is like you're there and you skate, you know. Yeah, it's like, like, it's I like mean, a gym. A lot of people sort of. hang out. I mean, you hang out a lot there too. I hung sure, out there all sure. the time when I was a kid. But at the same time, you're like, it's always skateboarding and it's like perfect obstacles that you and you're kind of like perfecting your your like craft like right. skateboarding on there so i think that definitely plays like large role in like so many good skaters coming from here mm-hmm. that you have like perfect uh, conditions mm-hmm. not perfect conditions it's like imperfect because the weather is bad and there's like rough really rough street spots in scandinavia but you kind of you're in also that you're locked inside then all like six to eight months and you're skating in the park and then one city good weather you really want to go out and like film and do stuff and skate street yeah 
because you know you're going to be like, oh, soon it's going to be fall or winter again, and we're not going to be able to do this. So it's not like you can't go like, oh yeah, mañana, mañana. It's yeah, like, yeah, oh yeah, it's now. <laughs> yeah, you need to take advantage of uh, of the good weather when yeah, it's there. Of the good weather. So I mean, and it, there becomes this rhythm in it, you know, like even with poetic with the brand, it's like, oh, summer is like we're outside a lot, we're filming, we're skating, and winter is like, oh, you're like skating indoors and editing and stuff. Yeah. Or, or I mean, recently we've actually been like, it's I think it, that happened in COVID that we're like, oh because the indoor park was close a lot we started skating outside when it's really cold in the winter too so okay that's kind of like my a newfound passion okay <laughs> maybe, maybe not call it a passion but to go like go to the plaza when it's like minus six seven eight degrees and like wow close on no one else there and oh just yeah go there there's and a reason for where... that <laughs> yeah but i think it's like i used to never do it and then like when the park was closed i started doing it a lot like with, okay especially with my friend dylan here who's also like doesn't have a problem with it and and we just go and like you bike there, you get warm, and then you just skate like intense skateboarding for like an hour and a half or two, and then you're like sweating, you build up like so you're warm. Yeah. And then it actually works. And people I kinda like it that people are like, You're fucking crazy, like you're going like when it's like minus five, five six degrees skating yeah. and there's like ice or snow, you know. Must be difficult, yeah. <laughs> yeah but it's also about it's it's like it, it looks nice i think there's also like there's no distractions but it looks nice it's like it's very much like a part of like the scandinavian identity uh, True. too yeah. that it is like really bad weather but you kind of work with those elements and skate throughout that mm -hmm. but it definitely takes like a little bit more of you but i'm i'm super into it now so <laughs> <laughs> i like it yeah no it's interesting because uh I, like it reminds me it makes me think of um they don't have bad weather there but brazil for example they have the most amazing mm. skaters like and i guess probably because they have the worst spots so to speak like uh worst yeah. conditions like terrible ground yeah. but that makes a special breed of a, a special type of skateboarder i guess and mm. uh and when you bring those skaters to europe or the u.s they annihilate everything because they're so fucking powerful yeah and they appreciate it i think just like we appreciate good weather you know like mm -hmm. it's when we go on trips with poetic in the winter and you, everyone gets out of the plane and you you're landing in like grand canary or something yeah. and you've only seen like cold and gray and rain and snow for for months you're like <gasps> yeah <laughs> and like it's just on you're everyone is so hyped you know and sparked you know the to just like make the most of yeah, it. yeah exactly all right so two last questions Hi guys, my name is Marcus. I've had the pleasure of working together with Tom on many different kind of projects throughout the years. And uh, before I ask my question, I just want to give a big shout out to Tom for helping all the young skaters he's been helping throughout the years with advice, sharing his knowledge about the skateboard industry and so on. It's uh, much appreciated. Uh, thank you, Tom. We all love you. And now to my question. Tom, you're known as the bunking of Malmö, Sweden, but you haven't always skated like this. So when did you start to change up your skating? Uh, how was this transition? How was it received by other skaters? And uh, what was your thought process about changing your skateboarding in this kind of way and niche it in the way you have right now? Thank you so much and uh, enjoy the rest of your interview, guys. Bye. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, such kind words. Yeah, I mean, we touched yeah, upon we it, talked with, about uh, it but, yeah. with uh, skating, but it's uh, definitely like I was always attracted to originality in skateboarding and something that's like very personal and carries like the, an identity. And I think starting with the nose taps and everything and then moving into like wallies and slap this and then like you start like also, I think it's also nice to like, it sounds like weird when you when you say it, but you like you inspire yourself you're like oh i did this maybe then maybe i can do that you like you build on one thing that you did and it goes deeper you know mm -hmm. and then it's like when i started doing the nose taps i was like oh maybe one day i can do a flip out of it you know and like you move into into that and uh, the way it's been received i think it's it's uh, of course like love and hate you know yeah like, uh, I started skating in a way that maybe not a lot of other people do. So, of course, it stands out more and then maybe attracts like some attention, mm -hmm. which has been really cool. And I'm thankful for that, you know. And then at the same time, you like differentiate yourself from other skaters. And then some people don't like that and think it's it's whack or it's like gimmicky, like something that gets has gotten thrown around a lot, you know, yeah, like yeah, yeah. circus skating or something. And I'm, 
I'm fine, you know, with that. That's if someone thinks that, that's uh, that's up to them, you know. Like, sure, sure, you can be appreciated by everyone, you know. But to me, it's been a part of like, yeah, creating your own identity and and your own your own type of skateboarding. Mm-hmm. And uh, of course, there's been a thought process behind it, you know. It's uh, I think if you're gonna try to create something, you always have to think about it too, you know. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. But then that, now it's also gone on for so long. I feel like mm-hmm. that. I, you also get like it just becomes the way you skate and it naturally develops you know yeah, yeah yeah then you think of new opportunities like i have the dream to be able to like i haven't seen anyone i mean jeremy does them on like small smaller like on the venice slappy but to do like slappy back nose blunt from the side just, oh yeah, like, yeah right up into from a big like on a real ledge or, like straight into the backside nose blunt slide or something mm. there's so much stuff like when you start thinking about that that's like oh that would be really cool and i haven't really seen that and then you can just brainstorm those tricks you know yeah did you ever try to do that like on those uh benches that you skate a lot in malmo like uh do a, yeah. do a slappy i don't know how to call it a wall wally back nose blunt yeah i mean i can do it to like back nose grind reverts and yeah. stuff so I, i've been thinking but i think the the on the benches at swamp and they're slightly too sharp i'm looking for someone's got the, the tip on the on the on the good spot you know but something that's like really rounded the edge so you can kind of slide over with the wheel straight into the backs and nose blunt slides okay but i think if i find the spot maybe samuel camweller he's been really close to doing it he's like really he's the the better wally skater really <laughs> he okay. also inspired me a lot i'm gonna definitely shout him out there that he definitely inspired a lot of the tricks that i do too you know and like doing the tricks with him it's always fun because we can also brainstorm tricks but he can do uh crazy like slappy backside lip slides where he just like wallies up front side and really hide and can like really sit on them for a long time wow and uh he's he's really good at that also such a good style all right very last question another mama friend of yours Hey, Tom, the Poetic Collective has grown and in its own way and fast. And I wonder, where do you see it in five years and in longer term? What do you want it to say about the Poetic Collective in the history books in the future? Thanks. Bye. Jan Dahlqvist. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> also an inspiration and such a legend in the community and mama. Yeah, yeah. He's done so much and is such an inspiring person to talk to because he's like this, the way he skates mm-hmm. still is so crazy. And he's just so determined. Yeah, he's like he seems super motivated when he skates like when, yeah. super motivated and super sick in every way as a person, and a skater. Yeah. And, all. and like when I had the privilege to work a little bit, but it just one of the best things about it was like just spending time with him because he's such an inspiring person to be around mm-hmm. so much energy. Yeah. Yeah, John, John always says I should just kill the brand. That's what he told me recently. Because he's like, that coolest thing is like to build a brand. And then like when you're doing good, you just fucking shut it down. You know, like it's over. And that's like how you get remembered. And I was yeah. like, oh. Leave on a high kind of. Or yeah, I see. Yeah. So that's always his advice. So maybe I should just take that. <laughs> no, but I think uh, it's grown. I don't know if it's grown like fat. You see brands coming with like such super hype these days. With, you know, and there's like a big name behind it. Sometimes it goes like, boom, straight straight away yeah but it obviously didn't have like a big name like behind it i i'm not like if you think about like pontus who's such a legend when he started at polar already and he comes with such like force or even jeremy like mm-hmm. something i didn't have it was more like a small organic process you know and i'm happy we are where we are you know yeah but yeah in five years i think now now i'm trying to reevaluate kind of where we are after this video and see where we move forward and uh, try to find like just make everything better because what it has been and still is to a very large part uh, like a diy project where i do a large part of the work i just do from here you know mm-hmm, mm-hmm. from this room except the packing basically and then uh, but to kind of slowly move into just working with uh, more photographers and like doing better lookbooks better quality apparel it's and like it's a slow process it's already good but you can always improve and, and make it better yeah. you know and uh make it like a it's now like legit skate brand but you can i just improve that and see like new team riders and try to i wasn't create like also opportunities for the team riders 
for the people I work with, kind of what Marcus touched upon, because like we talked a lot about that, him and me, that that's always been like a goal of mine when I do stuff. Poetic or now with Vans too, to just try to see like what can I help and offer like the people around me so they can take their paths and kind of become what they want to become, you know? Yeah. And uh, if I can offer opportunities in that, I think that's something that I I also really want to do, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, in five years, I hope Poetic is, is bigger and better in every way and that we can support the people we work with better and uh, also do a lot of fun and creative projects and keep our own identity within skateboarding at the same time as we also develop it you know mm-hmm. all right tom my question for you uh, what's the secret sauce and what's the recipe that you could share with maybe other other people that want to start brands or have smaller bedroom brands and like what what really eased it off or made it take off for you at poetic any advice or hacks for the people well thanks yuga for the question uh shout out to yuga he's a mom legend who helped me out since i was a kid with everything from shoes to how things work within the skateboarding industry well um i don't know if there's a secret sauce to making a skateboarding company take off but there's there's definitely some things that you can maybe keep in mind and i think first is maybe when you're starting off to kind of identify like what's your thing what's your niche within skateboarding what's going to be like your identity for the brand that will make you stand out from all the other brands that already exist and then i think secondly it's easier than ever today to start a skateboarding company it's easy to print boards make some shirts start an instagram account film a little promo and that's it it started you know but then a lot of people may be expected to take off straight away and to for it to become their their job and i would say that normally that's not the case it's maybe the case when someone already has like a big name within the industry like strobik now started violet and it's straight away like sold in all all the cool shops across the world but normally when you start it you maybe don't have that and then you do all that that first initial work and then you kind of it's maybe doesn't take off because normally things do actually take like a while to take off and you have to stay consistent with your work but you see it a lot with new companies coming within skateboarding and also like i think it's for any type of company really that people come out with a lot of energy the first one two years and kind of lose the energy and maybe then decide to just stop doing the company which is a shame because I think normally if you keep working on it, you stay consistent, then maybe it will take off. So I think like the only secret sauce there is is to stay consistent and keep working and kind of be in it for the long term. With Poetic, like for a lot of years, I had a full time job and I did Poetic and I did the graphics, the sales, the filming, the editing, the skated for it. Basically, all of it. So you're working like 200% with your company and 100% with your day job. And uh, that's just the way it is. And then at some point, it became my job. But it definitely wasn't like that for the large part of the time that the company has existed. Uh, It's been like a a side project, but that I did put like 200% into. So sorry, Yuga, no secret sauce to making it take off. Just uh, a lot of work. I wish I had a secret sauce that I could share with people that would have been sick. I would be would be so stoked if someone had told me <laughs> that there was a secret recipe. Maybe there is, and I just missed it. But yeah, shout out to you again. Cheers. All right, well, let's wrap it up here. Thanks, uh, thanks yeah, very thank much, Thank you Tom. so much, Kontan. It was, uh, it was an honor and a pleasure to, uh, that you took the time to, to ask me these questions. No, so, uh, thank you, yeah. That's it for my conversation with Tom Botwid. Go follow Tom on Instagram at Tom Botwid. Support his amazing work with Poetic Collective on the website PoeticCollective.com, on Instagram at Poetic Collective, and if you haven't seen it already, go watch the brand's latest video clouds on YouTube. Thank you for tuning in. See you in a few weeks for a new episode of Beyond Boards. Beyond Boards.